I want to start off today, um, we are going to be in John 1, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. It's the last of the Gospels. Uh, John, if you're not familiar with John, if you don't know your New Testament, um, you're welcome to grab a Bible. They're in the pews, iPhones, iPads, and there's also Bibles on the Welcome Center. If you don't have one of your own, take one off the Welcome Center and take it home. That's our gift to you. But we're going to be in John 1 today, and I'm going to read to you a big chunk of John 1 35 through 51, where Jesus calls his first disciples. So if you want to follow along, um, I'm going to stay in John 1 all throughout this morning. So keep your finger in there or put a bookmark in there so you don't lose your place. But I'd like to just read this to you. And it says in John 1, 35 through 51, where Jesus calls his first disciples, it says, The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Verse 43. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and he said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's God's word for today. Now today's sermon is about one of the most feared things by most Christians. What is it? Personal evangelism. Exactly, artists. Personal evangelism. Sharing your faith with another person. I mean, after all, I might not know what to say, right? Right? I mean, they might ask me a question I don't have an answer to. I might, I might fail. I mean, I'm, I'm not gifted in evangelism. Where's Billy Graham when you need him, right? Isn't, isn't, isn't evangelism the pastor's job, pastor? I'm, a, I'm afraid. Indeed. Witnessing is one of the most neglected commands in all of Scripture. And, and of course, you know, if we're honest, we neglect a number of commands in Scripture. We're not always the best at praying, right? We're not always the best at reading our Bibles. Some of us are better than others. But there are times where we do not do as we should. Where we don't follow through with the Christian disciplines. But when we consider the fact that Jesus' final words to the church were a challenge to us to spread the gospel all over the earth, throughout the whole of the world, at least to me it seems a little bit ironic that most Christians have never led another person to faith. Most Christians, in fact, surveys reflect this, if people are true, and generally they are in anonymous surveys, most people have never even shared their faith with another person, with another unbeliever. Now you might say, you know, Pastor Chris, I'm afraid, right? I don't think well on my feet. You know what? 
There's honestly not a Christian alive probably who hasn't felt that exact same fear and anxiety that you have a time or two. We all have feelings of anxiety. Whenever, whenever I am about to share the gospel with somebody, I get a little nervous. It just is part of the territory. So fear really is no excuse. You might say, you know, Pastor Chris, ah, I want to share, but I, I don't know what to say. I, I'm afraid that they might ask me a question that I can't answer. Well, what do I say to someone, Pastor? Well, hopefully in today's sermon, you'll hear a little bit and learn a little bit about a very basic method, method of evangelism. Uh, in fact, I think it's perhaps one of the most simplest, if not the simplest systems and processes of of witnessing tools that I'm aware of. And we just heard about it, in fact, as I read through this passage. It's, it's called the, the come and see method of personal evangelism. And before I explain the, the principles themselves, let's examine that text I just read together. Now, as we look at the, the book of John and John's gospel, we were introduced to the, the, the very first New Testament witness of who Jesus is. And that comes from John the baptizer. And from John, we learn, as we heard, that Jesus is the Lamb of God, this, this pre-existent one, the one who, who's going to come and baptize with fire, the, the Son of the living God. And we, we also find out that, that John has this very defined rule in relationship with Jesus. And John's job is to be the, the forerunner for Jesus. He's the one who's supposed to come and tell everybody that Jesus is coming. You better get ready, right? John was the, 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 the voice to call people to be prepared for the Messiah. And from there, John the baptizer basically turns things over to Jesus and kind of steps out of the way as far as ministry goes. See, John simply wants others to see Jesus. He doesn't want them to see him. Look at the, the first section in verses 35 through 37, John 1. And this is the, the second time John uses, if you're familiar with this passage, it's actually the second time John uses the phrase, the next day. Uh, it's to specify that these events kind of take place in a three-day cycle. On the first day, if you were to read earlier in verse 29 that I didn't read, John identifies Jesus from the crowd. And then this time, on the second day, John is there with two of his disciples, and, and yet his purpose still remains the very same thing. He wants to point people to Jesus, including his very own followers. Now, some people would have an ego. Some people wouldn't want to give up their followers, right? Not John. John is ready to, to push the birds out of the nest and send them on their way. And this section, which, which extends all the way to the end of this chapter, it displays a, a label that we could call maybe intimate evangelism. Pointing those closest to you to Jesus. And that is exactly what John does here. He points his very own followers to Jesus. He says, that's him. That's the Lamb of God. This guy, not me. And in verse 37, we observe this, this transfer take place where the text states, and they follow Jesus. John accomplishes his goal. He got his followers to follow Jesus. The word follow in John's gospel there is a word that's a rich word that actually stands for discipleship. It wasn't just, you know, like walking behind the guy like some puppy. Right? This is discipleship. This is, this is involved learning and growing and being shepherded by and, and serving with and loving with. This is discipleship. And it means a, a, a willingness to forsake all of these things to follow Christ and Christ alone. And, and the word that's used there in the Greek implies surrender. And so here is John's two disciples. Uh, we have Andrew that we know for sure, and perhaps John, the other John, not John the baptizer, but Andrew and possibly John, and they follow Jesus. Then in verse 38, uh, as the two disciples approach Jesus, he turns to them and he, and he asks them a, a, a penetrating question. He looks at them and he says, guys, what do you seek? 
These are Jesus' very first words in the Gospel. What do you seek? For thousands of years, the Jews had sought their Messiah. The Messiah was to be a, a, a political deliverer, a, a reliever of oppression, a, an earthly king. And now Jesus wants to know, what kind of Messiah are you looking for? What's your motivation, basically? What are you looking for? Are you looking for power? You know, some people, some people will follow people because they're going to ride their coattails to power, right? Are, are you looking for glory? Are you looking for fame? Are you in this just for self-satisfaction? Jesus is asking, what do you seek by following me? We should ask that, uh, that very same question of ourselves and others. What are we truly seeking in our relationship with Jesus Christ? Recognition? Prestige? Popularity? What is our motivation for following Jesus? Motives reveal sincerity. In Jesus' question, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a hidden answer. Because you see, Jesus is the fulfillment of the true seeker. He is the answer to the genuine seeker. Everything that an individual seeks can be found in Christ. What they are seeking in verse 38, they have found in 41. They found Jesus. The truth of the matter is, folks, we all seek something. As this world seeks for fulfillment and contentment, it searches in all of the wrong places. Remember that old country song? Looking for love in all the wrong places. You can buy my album in the lobby later. Right? But that's the way the world works. The world's looking for money and, and power and, and drugs and alcohol and sex and all sorts of other false avenues to give them their fulfillment and contentment. They're searching in the wrong direction. Genuine and, and lasting satisfaction can only come in Jesus Christ. So as Jesus asks, what are you seeking this morning? What is your motivation? Is it happiness? Contentment? Peace? Stability in a shaky marriage? Answers to life's questions? No. Know that fulfillment is only found in Jesus Christ. He is the answer for the seeker. And we all seek something. The two disciples answered Jesus' question with a question themselves. They say, Rabbi, you know, Rabbi is a title that's, that's given to only the very most learned scholars. They say, Rabbi, where are you staying? See, their, their, their question reveals their true desire. They want to spend some time with Him. They're seeking to get to know Him better. They seek to become more acquainted with Jesus. This question that they ask reveals that their motives are, are pure and genuine. So what is Jesus' response then? Jesus says to them, Come and see. This is an Invitation. You, you can imagine Jesus spreading his arms and saying, Come and see. And it's this, this open invitation for them to come and spend time with him, getting to know him. Come with me, and you will see. The, the call from Jesus there is to come into relationship with him. It is a call to discipleship. It's a, a call to have your eyes open to God's truth. And the call to come is a call to have transformation in your life by following Jesus Christ. And the disciples answered the call and they came. And then sure enough, if you read the rest of their stories, their lives were radically transformed. And if you spend time with Jesus, you will not be the same. 
As a result of this, this time with Jesus, one of the two disciples, Andrew, realizes, after he spent a little bit of time with Jesus, he realizes he's got to share this good news with his brother, Simon. And so immediately, he goes and he finds his brother to share with him this wonderful news. Simon, Simon, we have found the Messiah. Very interesting point about Andrew, you may not know. If you look at Andrew, every time in John's Gospel, wherever you see Andrew, Andrew is helping others to get to Jesus. Here, in 6.8, he, he brings a young man to Jesus. In 12.22, he brings Greeks to Jesus. Andrew was an aide. He, he was a helper to bring others to Jesus. And while Andrew might not get all the publicity, right, and as far as the Bible goes, he never received lots of attention, like his brother Simon Peter. Andrew nonetheless remained faithful to fulfill his calling, even though the spotlight wasn't on him. He brought others to Jesus. He was faithful to bring others to Jesus again and again and again. He didn't receive the recognition of some of the others, but he was committed to making sure people got to know Jesus. The truth of the matter is we need some Andrews. We need some people who will be committed to bringing others to Jesus. We need some older Andrews. We need some younger Andrews. We need some teen Andrews. We need some mom and dad Andrews. Some grandma and grandpa Andrews. We need deacon and deaconess Andrews. We need Sunday school Andrews. We need all of us to be more like Andrew. We need people that are committed to bringing others to Jesus. Can you picture Andrew? Andrew says, I I've got to go tell Peter. I'm going to go tell him right now. What is his news? We have found the Messiah. The, t t the title Messiah means the anointed one. And indeed, Jesus was anointed by God to serve as the great high priest, the one who would offer the final sacrifice for sin, his own life. And Andrew is excited to share this news with his very own brother, Simon. Simon, I found him. I found the Messiah. He is here and we have found him. Look at verse 42. Not only does he go and tell Simon Peter that he's found Jesus, but what does he do? It says, and he brought him to Jesus. That says it all, right? Right? He simply brought his brother Simon to Jesus. That is all Andrew knew to do at this point. Just get him to Jesus, right? Come and see. He pointed his brother to the one who could change him. Being an Andrew does not involve fancy evangelism methods or memorizing lots of scripture. That's all good. But being an Andrew simply means getting them to Jesus. Remember, we cannot change people. I wish I had that power. Probably would be really dangerous in my hands. Wave my magic wand, zap. I'd fix all the problems, right? Probably wouldn't work that way. You ever seen Bruce Almighty or Jim Carrey gets the prayer remote? Yeah, you understand. That wouldn't go well if I was God. But you need to know, each and every one of us. We do not have the ability to change people. Only Jesus can. We cannot make unfaithful spouses quit cheating. We cannot make alcoholics quit drinking. We cannot make drug addicts quit doing drugs. We cannot make lying, cheating, stealing, thieving, robbing people quit doing what they do. Our job is simply get them to Jesus. Simply to say, come and see. And so indeed, Jesus, he takes one look at Peter and he identifies him immediately as more than just a rugged fisherman. He identifies him as Petros, right? Which means rock or stone. 
And then he says, you are now Cephas, but you will become Peter. Jesus saw beyond the, the, the rough, headstrong kind of... If you know Peter, he's, he's, he's just this... He, he speaks before he thinks. He gets out of line. He, he's a smelly fisherman at this point in his life. He's lived all of his life on a boat gutting fish. Um, not the best smell, especially in a Mediterranean climate, right? And he sees Peter for who he really is. He was the solid rock. And not only does he see him for who he is, but who he will become. Jesus saw him for who he would be, even though it took Peter a while to get there. Now see, Jesus also sees us with that very same potential. You might be broken today. You might be thinking, oh, Pastor, I'm, I'm a mess of sin. Yes, we all are. But Jesus sees our potential and knows what we can be. He sees us for who we can be, not who we are. Get them to Jesus. This, this come and see evangelism continues on the next day. It says, on the third day, Jesus seeks out Philip, and evidently a, a friend, an acquaintance of some sort of, of Peter and Andrew. And he says, Jesus says to that guy, he says, hey, Philip, follow me, right? Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And here he seeks out Philip and he calls him. And we see in Scripture that Philip follows. Once again, notice Philip's immediate response if you're following along in John 1. He finds Nathanael and he testifies the very same thing. He says, hey Nathanael, listen up. We have found him. The one about whom Moses and the prophets spoke. We, we found Jesus of Nazareth. We found him. Now in scripture it tells us that. You know, old Nathaniel's a little bit more skeptical, right? What's Nathaniel's response to all of this? Anything good come out of Nazareth? Anything good come out of Achan? Anything good come out of Malmo? Right? Depends on which town you grew up in, if you like the one or the other, right? Can anything good come out of there? There was a, you see, the scathing question of Nathaniel's reveals there was a Galilean disgust with the Nazarenes. Nathaniel has some prejudice issues. And he doesn't respond immediately in faith. So what does Philip do? Right? Does Philip say, oh, well, all right, I guess I'm giving up on Nathaniel, I quit, right? He just walks away and quits and says, ah, well, all right, we're done with him. Moving on. Throwing in the towel. No, that's not what he does. He does the only thing he knows that he can do. His reply is simply, Nathaniel, come and see. He's basically saying, I don't, I don't have all the answers, brother, but come and see. You see, your skepticism will not prevent my witness. Nathaniel, just come and see. He won't take no for an answer. And once again, Jesus is in control. As a skeptical Nathan approaches, Jesus identifies him. He says, hey, here is a true Israelite, right? In whom nothing is false. He says, Nathaniel, I know you for who you are. Now, Nathaniel seems to be taken back a little bit by this. How do you know me? Right? And Jesus kind of draws him in. He says, I saw you even before you came. You were sitting under a fig tree. This guy's got to be gone. Whoa. How'd you know that? Jesus says, Nathaniel, I know who you are. I know everything about you. I know everything there is to know about you. I know what you think. I know where you go. I know what you do. Nathaniel, I know you. And I want you to follow me. Well, how do you think Nathaniel responds? Right? He places his faith in Jesus. You are the Son of God, right? You, you're the King of Israel, he says. This is a guy who just moments ago was kept it. Only the Son of God could know this. You must be him. 
And so Jesus answers, Nathaniel, I'm glad that you believed, but you believed because I gave you a sign. But here's the deal, brother. You're going to see greater signs than these. And as a matter of fact, I am the one in whom God is revealed. Come and see evangelism. Come and see. So what does this text teach us that we can use today about personal evangelism? What are the the basic principles of come and see evangelism? Well, if you're taking notes, they're in your bulletin there. The first one there is, the first principle of come and see evangelism is you need to recognize a prospect. Who should come? Right? If you are a believer, you have to have prospects. For John the Baptist, it was his disciples, right? For Andrew, it was his brother. For Philip, it was Nathaniel. For you, obviously, somebody different. It could be a, a, a family member. It could be a friend, a co-worker, somebody at school, a neighbor. But there is someone for everyone. So the first step is recognize them. Maybe right now even think about who you know who needs to come and see Jesus. Think about who God is placing on your heart right now. Recognize your prospect. The person might be a seeker, someone who's looking for the answers in all the wrong places. The person might even be a skeptic. Whoever they are, whatever their attitude might be, recognize who they are. Because they are your prospect. Every single Christian has one. In fact, most of us have many. But today, focus on just one. Because you see, folks, if every one of us were to focus on one and we brought one person with us next week, I'm going to have to find more chairs. Believe me, I will find more chairs. But I want you to think of that one person now. The first step in come and see evangelism is to recognize a prospect. To think about them. Is it a spouse, a child, a brother, a sister, a relative, a co-worker, a neighbor, a classmate, a friend? Recognize that prospect. The second principle of come and see evangelism is then to refer a person. Who should they see? Recognize and refer. After you identify your prospect, your task is to point them to Jesus. Your words are simple. Come and see. Folks, many are searching. Many are skeptical. Many are hurting. So many are wandering and lost with so little hope. But whatever might be the case, your responsibility is simple. Point them to Jesus. John the Baptist did it. Behold, the Lamb of God. Andrew did it. We found the Messiah. Philip did it. We we found him whom Moses and the prophets wrote, right? And you can do it too. Point them to Jesus. Point them to the rabbi, the great teacher who has all the answers to life's problems. Point them to the Messiah, the King of Israel, the one who came to provide hope for his people. Point them to Jesus, the the Son of Man, the one who lived a sinless life and died as a criminal for our sins. Point them to the Son of God, God who was robed in flesh. Point them to Jesus and all that He is. So you must refer the person to Jesus Christ. You see, programs are good. We've got Sunday school coming. We've got Wednesday evening programming. But you see, that's not what changes people. Church is good, right? Sunday school is good. But they don't change lives. Point people to Jesus. If we point them to the church and we fail to get them to Jesus, we fail. If we feed their hungry stomachs but we fail to tell them about Jesus, we fail. We must refer them to Jesus. Come and see. 
That is the testimony of the believer. The third and final principle of come and see evangelism is simply remember a purpose. Why should they come and see? I mean, what is the purpose of come and see evangelism? Why is it important? And as our text illustrates, it is important because Jesus is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And it is so important that we point people to Jesus because there is no hope of eternal life without Him. But there is another reason as well. We do have another purpose. We should get people to Jesus because Jesus changes lives. Jesus takes Cephas and he makes him Peter. Jesus takes the sinner and makes us a saint. Jesus takes the drunk and makes them sober. Jesus takes the prostitute and makes her clean. Jesus takes the spiritually sick and makes them well. Jesus takes the spiritually blind and helps them to see. Jesus takes the dirty and he makes them clean. Jesus takes the unclean and makes us pure. Jesus changes lives. And I believe that's why, why Andrew went to tell his brother Simon, why Philip had to tell Nathaniel, Jesus changes lives. And when Jesus changes your life, you want to tell others about it. You want others to know. You want to tell people about Jesus. So remember your purpose. Come and see evangelism. It's very, very simple. Recognize a prospect. Think about him right now. Who's God put in your life? Who's your prospect? How are you going to refer that person? It's all about Jesus. And then remember the purpose. Because Jesus changes lives. We need some Andrews. We need some Phillips. We need some believers who will determine, by God's grace, I will bring one person to Jesus. Can you imagine how Andrew felt when his brother came to Jesus? When his brother came to Christ. Can you imagine how he felt? Philip compels us to remember that God uses very ordinary people to bring others to Christ. Others who may make a a huge impact for the cause of Christ. So folks, determine on this morning. I will bring one. I will invite my prospect to come and see. Evangelism is usually advanced one on one. One person to another. One at a time, reaching one at a time. Come and see. Are you an Andrew? If not, determine on this day to be one. Let's pray.